It's true. The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Well, good morning, friends. Good to see all of you this morning. I just want you to know, Jared and I love you guys. We were praying uh, this week uh, with our staff and some of our leaders, even the last 48 hours, that God would just give us people who wanted to sing the songs of Jesus, the songs of heaven. And you know what? All of you just blessed my heart as, uh, as you were singing unto the Lord and honoring him. Would you just turn to someone and say, hey, Mark loves you for it. Go ahead, give him five for me. Mark loves you for it. Give him five. Hey, if you're visiting this morning, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. We're excited that you're here seeking the Lord. Listen, I know you could be doing something else. I mean, you could be golfing. You could be fishing. You could be wishing the Vikings were winning somewhere. I mean, or whatever, right? You could, but you know what? You're doing something even more important. You're acknowledging there's a God in heaven and that Jesus is the way that we're reconciled to the living God. So I just love you guys for that. So, hey, a couple quick things, really quick. If you haven't done this yet, if you know of men in our church who honor their wives, train their children, have not abandoned their families, love the gospel in the church, respect authority, assume responsibility, and so forth, if you know someone like that in our church, can't be a staff member, can't be one of the pastors, do me a favor, jump online. Uh, this is the last weekend because we're going to be giving some awards on Father's Day. Because why? We want to honor something the world says is evil, which is men who do good and godly things. And we need to celebrate the exact opposite. Also, uh, we have a baby dedication and, uh, coming up. So if you've got a new baby and, you know, we've got a, uh, an acquaintance. They have about 200 babies in their nursery. Now, I went in our nursery and there's not 200. So that means you all need to get busy. Okay? I'm not going to have you turn to your neighbor and say, get busy, but I'm just telling you. All right? Bless you all. Now, having said that, Wednesday, 3 o'clock, Wednesday, 3 o'clock at the Capitol in Rotunda, we're going to be pushing back against the whole ERA bill. We're going to have some of our friends who are leading that. I need as many of you as possible, Wednesday, 3 o'clock around the Rotunda, praying, standing together and saying, you know what? Uh, you're talking about abortion rights. Ab abortion can't have rights. They're not inalienable rights from God. But children have inalienable rights to live. And that's what that's about. And they're going to try and put a constitutional amendment in there that we can kill babies anytime. I'm just telling you, pray, stand up at this point. If you don't, well went to America. That's all I can say in the rest of the world. Hey, if you haven't been to the membership class, well, I encourage you to jump in there. Make sure you ladies have this in your husband's phone. Uh, so just go ahead and take his phone right now, put that in there, get it locked in, get him signed up. We're going to pray for Israel. We're going to pray for America before we jump into Philippians 4. And, and you know, as I was thinking this week about Israel, I was thinking about what's happening there. I'm thinking about what's happening, the anti-Semitism around the country and what's happening in America to try and destroy America. Um, uh, there's just so many things that come to mind. I mean, when you see... Uh, the violence, and you see the contempt, and you see the hatred. Let me ask you, there's two kingdoms. Which kingdom is filled with hate? Satan's kingdom, right? Not God's kingdom. Now, it doesn't mean God doesn't hate evil. I mean, there's a point where the righteousness of God hates evil. And if you do what is good, you and I should hate evil, whether it's in us or someplace else, or when someone does evil, and you and I assume responsibility for protection of our families, or whatever the case might be. You know, the Constitution doesn't secure the right for people to do vi assemble and do violent things. The Constitution says that you and I have certain inalienable rights to gather peaceably and do good things. And so, 282 protesters, too bad this took so long to do something about it, and sadly this deconstruction happening. Now, I want you just to think about two things that are happening as you're watching over the weeks and days to come. Since there's only two kingdoms and you know them by their fruit and you know what, what is, the kingdom of God is always going to lead to order and peace and dignity and so forth. Maybe not even a Christian, but a Judeo-Christian worldview will always lead to that. That's the reason if you, if you had to live someplace in the Middle East, you'd want to live in Israel and and while missionaries and those of us who are servants of Jesus will go into other countries around Israel, quite honestly, the place everyone goes to is Israel, right? Because of Judeo-Christian world, and you can see the difference. The, the kingdom of darkness, 
is going to be always filled with contempt, hate, and malice, and especially for anything that God says is good. I, I don't know if you have thought about these two encampments that we've been seeing. I mean, one wears masks, assembles, and does evil things, harms people, and then celebrates it. The other does acts of dignity. I don't know if you saw this picture. This was so powerful, I thought. The American flag being ripped down. Some Jewish students run up to the situation. Notice they're not wearing masks. Did you know pre nine or, or pre uh, pandemic, it was illegal to wear a mask like in a bank. And then all of a sudden, you and I are seeing the tellers wearing masks, right? Do you remember that? And now, you know, like, it, I mean, all you got to do is watch an old cowboy movie. The guys wearing the masks are the bad guys. <laughs> Hello? That's been true all through history. That's why those laws were in place. Bad people have to hide from government. People who do what's right, honorable, and noble do not fear government for doing good. You'll notice none of these guys are wearing masks. And you notice they're supporting the flag. Is that good, noble? Yeah, because it represents you. It represents the United States. Those who are tearing it down, exact opposite. Different worldviews. You say, well, what's the other worldview you want to do? Well, watch this video. This is the statue of George Washington on George Washington University's campus. And this statue happens to be in the middle of the pro-Palestinian encampment on the university. I was watching a, a video the other day on TV, and they were attacking George Washington. And I, I was sitting there thinking, you know, these people that actually made this video and attacking George Washington, how many countries did they start? How many constitutional congresses did they sit over? How many, how many times did God spare their life, like 11 times in battle for George Washington when his jacket's full of bullet holes and stuff? I mean, uh, what great things have any of these people done? Their great thing was attacking other people who had done something good for others. And you know what? Everybody sitting here and quite honestly all around the world have benefited from this guy named George Washington that lived. Was he perfect? No, Jesus is the only one that's perfect. Friends, don't buy into that folly. Good man did good things. God honored him. We've all benefited. Others have all benefited from around the world. When people deface it, I was just sitting there thinking, watching that video, the little punks that did that, you know? Seriously. Um, here's something interesting. You might have, have seen this. Uh, charter school, tuition free. That means, not, how many of you know school's not free? About $10,000, $12,000 per student. So we're going to tax all of you. Arabic classes. Now, historically in America, we've taught the important trade languages of the world. German, French, Spanish, etc. Um, Arabic has a religious connotation. It'd be like saying, oh, free classes, we're going to teach you New Testament Greek. That's the implication. And you say, well, that, Mark, you're, you're, that's a hyperbole, you know, you're, you're painting too broad a brush. Well, just watch hundreds of kids responding to Islam today, and it's followers of Jesus. We love Jewish people. We love people from the Middle East. We love our Islamic friends. We want them to all hear about Jesus. But friends, this will change America and civilization is very thin. It's kind of like your skin, right? The skin is very, how many of you are thankful you got skin? <laughs> it, it kind of keeps you all together, doesn't it? But it's very thin and civilization like that. And once you, once you destroy that thin layer, everything falls apart and worldview matters. Watch this. I 
I only show you that to simply say there's religious connotations to the things that are happening around us. Why? Because there's a spiritual battle in the background. And that's why you and I need to pray. We need to live godly. We need to live wisely in this age. And what's the ultimate solution? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, government can't fix that. Government can suppress evil. And they should. That's their job. They're a minister of God, Romans 13. But our job is to advance the gospel and influence government as much as possible in this constitutional republic. Friends, pray like crazy. Advance the gospel because we're living in days where Jesus needs to be honored. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm just so thankful for my friends. And God, I just pray right now for Jewish people around the world as they feel this hate and this tension. I pray that um, uh, as they are, are pushed back uh, into the promised land, back to the land of Israel, we recognize that that has prophetic connotations. It has um, an anticipation of what you have for Israel. And God, we just pray for the hearts of Jewish people to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in him as Lord God and Savior. Father, we pray that for every tribe, tongue, and nation, all of those across the Middle East, um, and all of those in every single continent. And Father, we pray specifically for the students who are turning to Islam today. Um, students who once would have grown up, grown up in, a, in a, uh, America with a Judeo-Christian worldview. And then it turned to humanism. And then this sort of postmodernism, and now towards Islam. And Father, the consequences are horrifying. God, we know what this looks like. Uh, we've traveled the Middle East. We've seen what this brings, the chaos, the contempt, the malice, the wickedness that, that ends up following. God, we just pray for our family, friends, and neighbors that in this hour they might turn their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and that you might show them grace and mercy. God, help us to be those that hold forth the gospel. God, frustrate the plans of the wicked. We think of this ERA bill that's coming up and potentially going to become law. God, we know that you hate those who shed innocent blood. God, may that not be true. Um, may that not be protected uh, in this land. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to Philippians 4, if you would. We're pursuing Jesus. We want to discover his joy. Now listen, this is so important. You got one thought today you need to walk away with, and here it is. Here's the thought. You got to fight for peace. You got to fight for peace. You read through the Bible, um, God cares about peace, but you live in a sinful, broken world, and sin always brings disruption to peace. You and I come into the world, let me ask you a question. Do you come into the world at peace with God or at enmity with God? Romans 5 says you come into the world at enmity with God. The question is, how do you have peace? Well, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have peace. Romans 5, 1, hear the words of Scripture. Therefore, having been justified by faith, you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you came in at enmity, and we get peace with God relationally through what Jesus does when we trust in him. Now, a new creature in Christ Jesus, I'm dead to sin, I'm alive to God. But now there's a war within, the Bible says, Galatians 5. See, before Jesus, I just liked doing bad and there was no real, there was no real problem with that. I could rationalize, justify, and of course, seek my own uh, crazy in sort of insanity because I'm a God unto myself. But now believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, now there's a war within. When somebody says to me, Pastor, I've got this really big struggle, great! They always look at me like, are you nuts? No. Listen, friends, the struggle ends for us when we cross into heaven. That's glorification. Between now and glorification, the war is within. Galatians 5, the works of the flesh, that's you who you are, is, is hatred and anger and malice and contempt and, and unrest. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, right? And so these, these, these are going to be at war. In fact, it says they're at war. They're contrary to one another. And then, and then you think about, so God wants us to have peace with him. He wants us to find peace within. You've got to fight for that. And then he wants us to find peace with others. And that's what this passage is about, about peace with others. Because uh, how many of you have ever had a conflict with another person? Uh, maybe it was uh, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, your, your children, your parents, uh, uh, your pastor. I'm glad none of you smiled at that one. <laughs> You're going to have to fight for peace, though. Peace is a difficult thing to, to, to secure and to maintain, right? It's one thing to have peace for a moment or an hour or two. The question is, can you maintain it over the course 
of time. And what I want you to see in this passage is that two people are called to peace who were at war. Now, you got to think about this. Maybe you're visiting for the first time. We're studying this book of Philippians. This guy by the name of Paul had started this church in Philippi. He's been gone roughly 20 years. He's in prison now, not having done anything bad, just simply preaching Jesus to people. And, and they've got some problems, and they want to send some money to him to help support the advancement of the gospel. And so they send Epaphroditus. He brings the money, tells them what's going on. He writes this letter back. Through this letter, he's been telling them, be one-minded, live at peace with one another, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. In other words, keep your attention on the Lord Jesus Christ, passionately pursuing him. That's the emphasis. Now we get to chapter four, and you can imagine some pastor, some elder standing up there reading this letter, and everyone's going, amen, amen, amen. And they get to chapter four, verse two. And it all of a sudden says, and odia, and everyone in the whole room focuses over on Odia. And Odia, I urge, and Syntyche, and then they all f- go over to Syntyche, and they're all looking, live at harmony with one another in the Lord. Can you imagine being called out in church like that? Well, there was an elephant in the room. These two ladies were in conflict. You can just imagine the tension of that moment. Everyone's going, oh, Odia and Syntyche are in big trouble. The guy reading the, the, the passage, he's like, oh my word, Paul. Right? How would you like to be put on the spot like that? <clears throat> the goal is, though, is that these ladies who were fighting with one another would come to a place of peace because it was disrupting the family. Think about your own family. Think about your nuclear family, right? If there's, dis- if there's conflict with, among two, it's going to affect everybody in the family. It's just the way, it's, it's the way sin works. It creates... Uh, uh, disharmony. It, it creates tension. And so look at this passage with me. It's such an amazing text. I urge Odia and Syntyche to live in harmony. And what's the sphere? In the Lord, right? Indeed, true com- uh, companion, I ask you also to help these women. That's really where the command is. This is just a, a statement. This is, this is him pleading with them uh, in sort of an indicative statement. Here is the actual exhortation. Help these women, who have shared in my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Ladies, fight for some peace. You and the rest of the church, help these ladies live in peace. Fight for peace. God, I just pray that we would learn from this text. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Look with me at chapter 4 just really quick. We've seen these different themes, and we get to chapter 4, and it's about peace of mind. And peace of mind in three avenues. If you look at those, those first, like, verse 2, 3, 4, right in there, 5, all those verses there are about relational peace. Why? Because all of us have relationships at some level, and there's always going to be the tension there because the flesh is always at work, Satan is always at work. Um, do you think there's any tension between men and women today? Do you think the world's trying to make more tension? Do you think the world's trying to make more tension between parents? Do you think the world's trying to make more tension between everybody? Absolutely. Get everyone agitated and mad and hating everything, okay? So he's going to say, God wants you to have peace in your relationships. In verse 6, oh, down through about verse, verse 10 or so, the focus there is on, on, on circumstances. How many of you ever had some circumstance of life that robbed you of peace? And so it's going to say, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with the, and, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds, right? So, so now he's going to move it from relationships with people to just the, the, the catastrophe of life. And then, and then he moves to finances. How many of you ever lost peace over money? <laughs> Hands go up, yeah. All right? And so then he's going to talk about money, and how do you have peace with money? Uh, because God, again, wants you to have peace in that, in that realm. So, so when it t- we talk about peace of mind, there's three movements there. It's relationally, it's just through all the circumstances of life, and it's financially. Jesus said, let not your heart be anxious. Remember he says that like four times in Matthew chapter 6. Very important. God wants us to have peace in that area as well. So that's what we're going to discover. Now I want you to find three things with me about Odia and Syntyche. Number one, he's urging them to live in harmony in the Lord. So number one, First thing we learn about these ladies, they're in conflict. Um, stick around, and you're going to find conflict. And you know, we, 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 we think 
that if we're in conflict and if we just get a divorce or if we just leave our family, we just move to another church or whatever the case is, move to another country, we're not going to have conflict. The problem is wherever you and I go, we're going to have conflict. The question is, how do we solve the conflict? So these two ladies in the church were in conflict. Second thing we find out about these ladies is that these women have shared in the struggle of the cause of the gospel. So when you look back, we don't know all the details, um, but apparently, you know, 20 years earlier when the Apostle Paul had started this church, Odia and Syntyche had trusted Christ. Apparently, they had helped him in the struggle. This, this Greek word here for the struggle is the idea of, of someone in the, in the gladiator game. So here the Apostle Paul, the imagery would be, you know, I'm fighting for the struggle of the gospel. These ladies were in the arena helping me. In other words, these were great servants of Jesus. They had a reputation for loving Jesus and being Jesus freaks and so forth. That's their past. That was on their resume. I mean, I hope that, that, that it would be said of you and me that we shared in the struggle of the cause of the gospel. Man, that, that is a high calling. Third thing we find out about these ladies is that they were genuine believers. Some people read these passages, oh, they must not have been believers because after all, they were fighting with one another and acting worldly. Notice it says, whose names are in the book of what? Life. There's only two sets of books. Either you're in the Lamb's book of life and you have everlasting life, or you're not. And if you're not, then you're gonna be judged according to your deeds and works according to the book of Revelation and all of us end up in the lake of fire. You need to get out of this set of books and into this set of books, okay? It's kind of like opening a new bank account. You need to move from this, this, this uh, set of accounting to this set because this one focuses on your righteousness. This one focuses on the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to you. So if you haven't trusted Christ, maybe you're watching online right now, you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord, God, and Savior. Why? So that you can be written in the Lamb's book of life. We want you in the Lamb's book of life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now there's three things I want you to find with me in the passage. Number one, they have to assume responsibility. They gotta take responsibility for their actions. I urge Odia and Syntyche to live in harmony. Notice there, they are pointed out. They've got the tension. They've got the problem. They've got to do something about it. They've got to assume responsibility. Friends, when something breaks down, you got to assume responsibility for your space in it um, and for your relationship in it. And it's work. It's hard work. Re listen, relationships aren't easy. If it was easy, then, you know, everyone would be happy. And most people aren't. Assume responsibility. I was talking to my grandsons, you know, uh, you know, when you're, when you're 12 and 10, you got to start thinking about a wife. <laughs> and so this last week, I was giving them lessons. I mean, why not? I started praying with them for a wife when they were just little teeny guys. And, you know, and so we were talking about wives. And one of the things you want to look for in a wife is that whether or not she assumes responsibility for her actions and for her deeds and for the spaces in her life. And, you know, you can talk theoretically about that. I mean, we read Proverbs 31, and, you know, the industrious woman, she's, uh, she's, a, she's a rare find. It says, an excellent wife, who can find? Her worth is far above jewels. She's what? priceless. How do you want to be priceless? Assume responsibility. She takes care of her family. She takes care of, 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 of her home, the home's needs, all those things. And, and she talks about her being industrious and buying a field, and, and she understands finances, and she, she controls herself. She, she manages the space well. And so, you know, the two little guys are looking at me. It's like, hey, okay, let me just translate this. When you're thinking about dating some girl, you need to ask their siblings what their bedroom looks like. <laughs> because if she can't manage this space, right, is she going to manage a household? Right? Is that, is that right? This is really important. And, and so if, if, she, if her bedroom looks like that, know that when you get married, your house is going to look like that. Your finances are going to look like that. I mean, just, okay, so it's very, very important. You might be a lady and say, well, what about me? You need to ask that guy you're dating, the siblings, what's his room look like? I mean, listen, if you're dating some guy and his room has a bunch of girl clothes in it, <laughs> I'm just saying, look elsewhere. But seriously, if you marry him, guess what? You're going to be picking up after him. And you know, there, there, there is going to be that, right? But now then the other side of this, you could go to the other extreme, 
where everything is so neat and tidy that you could never cook something in the kitchen because you wouldn't want to dirty a pan, right? I mean, so that'll drive you nuts too. Someone say amen. So, I mean, you know, trying to strike the balance in this is really what you're trying to, to figure out. So assume responsibility. Second thing is I want you to notice is, is that there's, this is a spiritual issue. I urge Odia and Syntyche to live, you two have to live in harmony. you got to live in sync. Not doing your own thing, not doing whatever. And everyone loves independence. I mean, you know, I have my rights. Well, that's true, you do have your rights. But if you're a follower of Jesus, my rights are to please him. And there are things in life where we have to live in sync with other people and not just create chaos because I'm self-centered. Um, you'll notice there the prepositional phrase, in the Lord. So as followers of Jesus Christ, in the Lord, we have to function in a way that there's, there's some harmony. Now, you know, I, I don't know about you, I grew up listening to country western music. I mean, I mean, you know, that liberal country western music would be like John Denver. Okay? <laughs> And then I heard the gospel, I came to church, and I realized there's a whole different genre of, of music. And then um, I had never, like, heard classical music or anything, and I'll never forget the first time I heard an orchestra. And you got all these people and all these instruments up there, and, and um, you know how they all, like, tune just before, right? And there, so you hear all these different sounds, and you're like, all, everybody's doing their own independent thing, and they're all focused on their part and what they're tuning their specific instrument but then the, 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 um, the conductor comes out, and they, they tap the table with their, with their little wand, and then, and then all of a sudden, everyone stops, and they all focus on the conductor, or the conductus. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> Carissa, okay. And, and they're, all, they're all focused there. And then all of a sudden, they lean forward, and they go, and all goes, boom, 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 or whatever. You know, it just, it just erupts. And it's all in harmony. It's amazing, isn't it? But why is that level of harmony? Because they're all focused on one conductor. Odia, Syntyche, how would they be able to have such harmony? Focus on one conductor, passionately pursuing Jesus Christ. Live in harmony in the Lord. That's why we're committed to one thing, passionately pursuing Jesus Christ. And people come and say, Pastor Mark, we don't like that we talk so much about Jesus and stuff. You'll be happier someplace else. <laughs> Next one. There. Got to get a hold of the problem. Now, this, is, this is really important. So they've got to, they, they need, he was pleading with them, live in harmony. Then he says, now listen, true companion, true comrade, I ask you also, help these women. They need help. They're going to need some help getting over to this hurdle. Now, listen, all of us have been in situations where we think we can get out of it. We think, you know, like we're strong enough, we're smart enough, we're agile enough, we can do it. But quite honestly, you need help. How many of us need help in life? All of us, right? I mean, when you were born, did you need help? When you're old, are you going to need help? Why do you call 911? Because you need help. Why, why do you call the doctor? Because you need help. I mean, just all through life, you're going to need some help at different times. I was with my brother-in-law one time, and we'd gone way up into the mountains, and, and uh, we, were, we were coming back. And as we were coming down the road, you know, we're kind of like looking out the window, and there's elk, and there's deer, and there's coyotes, and there's uh, eagles, and different things. And so we're going to watch, and it's like super deep snow. We were cutting, we were blazing the, the, the trail in and out of there. And he hit a snow drift, and all of a sudden, the wheel jerked out of his hands. How many of you have had this experience? And we ended up in the ditch, boom, buried in the snow. And we are miles and miles and miles and miles from nowhere. Now, we've got to make a decision because the snow is so deep. I mean, it was, it was, it was probably this, this deep. And it's like, do we try and walk out, or do we stay here and wait? It's 11 o'clock. It's going to get dark at 5 May not get back before dark. I mean, this is, this is high mountain country in Colorado. And so, you know, it's going to be really cold that night. It's going to be, you know, negative numbers. So we're trying to decide what to do. And we, we tried to dig ourselves out. Everything that we did, you know, all it did was just, every time you hit the gas, it just moved us a little deeper into the, the mess, right? 
We just, we couldn't do it in ourselves. So we're sitting there trying to decide what to do. And all of a sudden, here comes a guy on a tractor. Thank you, Jesus. Right? But what's so amazing to me, while we were so stuck and we were so helpless, he hooks onto it with the tractor. And I mean, it doesn't like, it's like, not like he's got to like, you know, peel out or anything. It's just a little, a little, that's it. We're right, like out of it and on the road again. I mean, how many of you have ever like had someone get stuck or whatever? And like two or three of you, you know, you get a little push and all of a sudden you're okay. Isn't it amazing? You couldn't do it. You just need a little, little help. And that's exactly what we need many times in conflict. Now, there's, there's seven things I've discovered that, that help me in conflict. And actually, I kind of run through these seven things. And I want to encourage you, write these down. You say, uh, what'd you learn in church today? You learn how to help people. Help yourself. Help other people navigate the complexity of relationships, okay? So here's the checklist I go through. So like a couple comes in and they're fighting or friends are fighting or whatever the case might be or or you're at a board meeting or in the workplace. These seven things are always seven things you gotta come back to at some point, but most of us never even think of a checklist. I mean, imagine trying to fly an airplane and you don't have a checklist. You want to have a checklist in life. Here's seven things that will help you. They've helped me. They've helped hundreds of other people. Number one, you need to hear the story. Proverbs 18 says this, the first to plead his case seems right. Odia and Sintiki, they're fighting. You go to Odia Odi and say, what happened? She's so evil, right? And she's filled with emotion. She's pointing her finger. All the rationalization and 35% of the story, right? And you automatically take sides. How many of you ever took sides with someone and regretted it later? Right, that's just... My grandma used to say that all the time. You better hear both sides of the story before you make a decision, right? And so you want to be able to hear the whole thing. Otherwise, you're going to assume the person's right, only to find out later there's more to the story. So listen carefully. Get enough of the story so that you can make a good decision. Don't assume the first person you talk to has all the information. Just really important, just important principle. The second thing is, is that you got to look at the fruit, Right? And I always come back to this because this has answers so many problems in life. Jesus said, good trees have good fruit. Bad trees have bad fruit. There's only two kingdoms. Good, kingdom of God, good. Kingdom of Satan, bad. Now, what's crazy in our society is because we don't know the difference between good and evil anymore. Instead of saying, oh, here's good fruit. Today we say, oh, it has good fruit. That makes me feel bad, so therefore we could chop this tree down. Think about it. Today, you get a student who's getting an A in school, and those of us who are C students feel bad because we didn't get an A. So what we have to do is reduce that person's ability to make an A, and everyone is just going to get a D in the class. Or think about it from America. I mean, friends, for for A hundred years, people in oppressed situations around the world came to America to find freedom and opportunity, the land of the free. Now we're told that because of opportunity and freedom of a Judeo-Christian worldview is evil, and rather than saying other countries, you could have something better. A Judeo-Christian worldview, you can have a constitutional republic. You can have people that are responsible for their own actions that conduct themselves with dignity and honor and grace and so forth. And you could have something greater. Instead, let's destroy America so America is just as destroyed as everything else in the world, right? What you and I should do, if we're wise, we'll look and say, which kingdom from this fruit that we're seeing in this this relationship, which one's right? Don't kill the good person. This this, This is so important. Today, oh, everyone's guilty. No. No, not, every, not necessarily. Figure out the story. Find where there's good fruit. And when someone's got bad fruit in their life, hey, this is, this is how you get over here. You want to have good fruit in your life. I mean, how many of you want to have more peace? I do. So therefore, I need to understand how peace is cultivated and cultivate that. Uh, several years ago, I was with my son, John. He had just moved to Alaska, and we were on a backpack trip. We were going seven miles up the hill. Now, in Alaska, it's not like living in the desert where I grew up 
where you're always carrying water. And be why? Because in Alaska, there's always three things when you're out in the wilderness. You're always going to be cold, wet, and miserable. <laughs> and so knowing that, we were going on this 11-day, 12-day backpacking trip, cold, wet, and miserable, we didn't carry any water. And so we started the seven-mile trek up the hill, and it was the one day that it was hot, warm, bug-infested, and, and there was no rain, and it was, it was amazing. And now we knew eventually we were going to hit, we went from a lake, we were going up in this high country, we'd hit the stream. So anyways, we didn't, weren't worried about water. But after about five hours of going straight up and sweating like crazy all day long and not being cold, wet, and miserable, um, all of us, the two of us became really thirsty. So we're starting to look at the berries in a whole new way, just to get a little moisture in your mouth, you know what I'm saying? And so we're looking at these, these berry bushes, and there's these wonderful high bush cranberries. The problem is there's these band berries that look just like high bush cranberries, except they have a little black dot on the bottom of them. And if you take that fruit, you'll have a cardiac arrest. No joke. So in other words, there's consequences that can come upon us. Fruit matters. What kind of fruit do you have in your life? Mimic those who have good fruit. Listen, we need to ask the insight, wisdom, how did, how did you get more fruit? How did you get more godly fruit in your relationship? How did you get more godliness in, in this situation? And then how do we cultivate that in, in my own life so I can have more blessing? The, sec, the, the next one is there we got to find the root. And listen, when there's conflict, you need to remember this. All conflict at some level you're going to find the root is going to be someone's got didn't get something. You have a lust. You have a desire. Notice, what is the source of our quarrels and conflicts? What's the root? There's going to be some desire. I didn't get what I want so I can murder other people. I hate that person because I didn't get what I wanted. And we see that with little kids. you got to get the root. How many of you have seen someone already sitting out in their grass here in Minnesota with a screwdriver taking out the weeds? Right? All right? You got to get the root. So look at the fruit first, and then if it's the wrong fruit then you got to go for the root. Does that make sense? So I always tell people, pull weeds and plant new seeds. Pull the weeds that lead to destruction in our lives from the kingdom of darkness. Plant new seeds. It'll take time, but they will germinate. How many of you know you don't get fruit the next day when you, when you do something good? It takes time in relationships for those things to, to, to blossom. Then we got to discern the issues. This is really important. Uh, a lot of people... A lot of people don't understand this. There's, how many of you know that there's commands in the Bible? There's commands in the Bible. There's commands, principles, and then it hones our conscience. And those three things shape how we should, how we do things. So there's commands in the Bible that are positive. For example, um, uh, uh, work, with your, work with your hands. He, uh, 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 another, another one would be uh, love your wife. How many of you think that's a good command? Love your wife. <laughs> Ladies, that was your chance. <laughs> you missed it. Okay? Love your wife. And then, and then the negative side is uh, do not commit adultery. How many think that's a good idea? All right. Now, in the middle here, uh, when I was a kid, they used to call it gray areas. They're not gray areas. It's either, it's either righteous, do this, or it's sinful, do that. And then there are areas where God is silent. He doesn't care. But this is where most people fight. They fight in churches. They fight in homes. They fight in relationships over things that God doesn't care. And he says, pick, your, pick whatever side you want. It doesn't matter. I really don't care. Just love one another and let other people pick. Now, our family, we have this ongoing war. Uh, my, my, my one son, he likes his meat like raw. I mean, so, like when we go, like if he, if he wants a steak, how do you want your steak done? Bleeding. He wants it bleeding so if you had a good veterinarian, you could save it. <laughs> Yuck. Then there's my wife. She wants it pink in the middle. You know, lukewarm. Hello, didn't Jesus say that he doesn't like the lukewarm? And then there's, there's the spiritual ones in our family. <laughs> and the spiritual ones know, well done. I mean, well done, thou good and faithful servant. <laughs> Hello. Right? Now, listen, we could all fight over that. Or you can say, I don't care if you're lukewarm. I don't care if you want it raw. I don't even care if you're a vegetarian. It keeps the price of steaks down. 
I don't care. Jesus don't care. Don't fight over it. You understand what I'm saying? Christian friends, listen, most church splits are over things Jesus doesn't care about. I'm just telling you, 36 years, hundreds of churches we've been involved with. I'm telling you. What is good for you, raw steak, as a good thing, let it not be spoken of evil of. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, doing the right thing, not doing the wrong thing, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Man, you, you just got to figure it out. It's one of the things I always try and figure out. Are we fighting over something that actually has a theological, a moral issue here that God takes aside? If not, then you just give everyone a lot of space and grace. Turn to someone right now. Space and grace. Space and grace. It'll give you a lot more peace if you can figure that out. Next one here, just really quick, and that is roles. Understanding roles. A rebellious man. What does that mean? A rebellious man is someone who is under authority, but he does not like the authority that he's under. How many of you know God created authority? He created authority in the home. Uh, parents, train up your children in the, in the way they should go. Children, um, obey your father and mother. Is there order and structure there? How many children don't like that structure? I mean, quite honestly, as a parent, I don't like it. I mean, I get tired of dealing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you've got little kids, it's, it's work. But if they don't do their job, there's consequences, Right? In the church, elders have a responsibility. They're going to give an account to God. I mean, I was in my 20s, and it's like, you know, we're like leading this church, and God is blessing, and there's some people who like don't like it, and they, they're, you know, and it's like, who are you, kid, to tell us what? I'm just telling you I'm following Jesus. We started the church. Jesus is with us. I have a responsibility before God. You have a responsibility to follow, according to Hebrews 13, 17, but you don't read the Bible anyways and don't care. Um, government. Is government a minister of God? Yeah, according to Romans 13. And so, listen, if government doesn't do its job, does it create havoc? Yeah, go look at the southern border. Anyways, you get the point. When you walk into the room, you have to make a decision. And you should do it consciously. Most of us have never done this consciously in our life. And it's part of the reason we have so much conflict. You walk in the room, am I supposed to follow? Is this a peer? Or do I have a responsibility to lead? At any given moment, and sometimes in a meeting, it'll actually shift. Sometimes I'm leading a meeting, I'm the leader, and then... And then because I'm among leaders, like in the elders, you know, I'm leading some part of that meeting. I'm a leader among leaders. And then I have to step back and we're all discussing something and everyone has equal say. Why? Because we're peers. And then there's a point where I, they can fire me, so then I have to follow. <laughs> because if there's a decision made, maybe I'm not quite on the same page, but the decision's that, then it's like, okay, then I have to follow. Then, and likewise, them as well. So in a meeting, you might even switch. Listen, the healthier you are, the faster you figure this out, and you can make the decision. Most of us have never even thought about the differences in those. I guarantee you'll bring you a lot more peace in your life. So when you walk in the room, always ask who's in charge. Everyone knows Charles is in charge. <laughs> Apply wisdom. Listen, wisdom's it's, it's, it's ways um, and its paths are always going to end up being peaceful. The wisdom of God will always lead to peace. That's one of the key distinctions just like, just like that room you haven't painted. How many of you got paint for a room that you haven't finished? Right? It doesn't, it doesn't do any good to have it in the can. At some point, you've got to go and put it on the wall. Apply wisdom, God's wisdom, to these things, and it will always lead to peace. Then lastly, and that's simply this, you have to just be committed to seeking peace. I'm going to seek peace, whatever other people might do, if possible, as far as it depends on you, Mark. As far as it depends upon you, put your name in there. Be at peace with all men. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. This is really important, especially as people go through different... See, God wants us at peace, and the question is, will we be peacemakers? Friends, you've got a purpose, and be intentional. And there's going to be different capacities that people have, and they will change. And sometimes we would love to have peace at this level, but the only peace level we're going to get is here because of their capacity, or maybe your capacity. I mean, I always tell Jera, I hope I go senile before you. <laughs> Why? Because, because that leads to... The, I'm just, it gets difficult, Right? Um, 32-year-old friend of mine, married to a lady, have a couple of kids, was in an accident, hit his head, changed his whole personality. They used to live at this peace level. Now they're good if they're at this peace level, right? And so these things change. Find as much peace in the spectrum and abilities that God has given to us. Find as much peace. Be committed to seeking that. Would you do me a favor? Would you stand right now? Would you just turn to someone and say, fight for peace? Go ahead, tell them.
peace is not natural in the fallen world. Peace is natural in heaven. Are you going there? Have you trusted Christ? If you haven't, today's the day. You need to trust him. There's going to be a prayer team up here when we close in prayer. Come and see one of them. Maybe your heart's at unease right now. You just need someone to pray with. Here at the end of the service, here's our friends. Lord, I just pray for all who can hear my voice, those who are joining us online, those who are in the room right now. God, we confess that peace with you, peace in our hearts and peace with others is a byproduct of heaven. And God, I pray for the maximum amount of peace in this life for each of my friends who can hear my voice. Wherever they're at in the journey, whatever their relationships are right now, I pray for maximum peace. God, help them to fight for peace. For their sake, for your glory, for the advancement of the gospel. Christian friends, would you just cry out in your heart right now, God, help me to do what Jesus said. To be a peacemaker. To find the path of peace, restoration, reconciliation path of blessing for myself and for my family, my friends, my neighbors, my church, the world. God, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.